You know, Jesus is alive. Amen. We know that. He rose from the dead. And, and He comes to us by His Spirit, lives in our hearts. But you know, there's a being uh, called Satan that's alive too. And I was just talking with Eric, and he said, you wouldn't believe what I, what I did to get here today. He said, uh, my car, you know, broke down last night, and it took us two hours to get from Oakdale to Modesto, and a hard time getting here today. And uh, he says, really hard for me to get here today. Well, today is a special day for Eric O'Brien, and the reason is because he's going to get baptized today. Amen. Yeah. Eric, come on up here. I've got some really hard questions I'm going to ask you. But I think you can say yes to them. Do you believe in Jesus as your Savior, that He died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and rose from the dead that you might have new life in Him? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus as your Lord? Will you listen to Him through the Holy Spirit and seek to be His faithful disciple for the rest of your life? Yes. Do you promise to make use of the means of grace to share faithfully in the worship and service of the church, to give of your substance as the Lord may prosper you, and to give your whole heart to the service of Christ and His kingdom throughout the world? Yes, I do. Amen. Now, a little later... You, well, here's your certificate. This does not come into effect until after you come out of the water. So uh, we'll see you a little later. After the end of the service, we're going to do the baptism. And we're so glad that you're making this step of faith. He's already shown faithfulness to the Lord. You've seen him in the worship services and different places uh, for quite some time now. When, when I first met Eric, he had stopped by because he, was, he and his wife were interested in the marriage 911 class that we have. And uh, I, heard, I overheard him and Diane talking. And then I went out to see him and meet him and talk to him. My door was open in my office. And Eric says, I'm not much of a church goer or much for church. I just want you to know that. And I said, well, we're not going to make you go to church to go to this class. And uh, he always has been really honest and upfront about where he is in his faith. I remember a little bit different. Oh, how, how, do, you, how do you remember it? What? I said, well, you know, I'm not much of a religious person. Or, mm -hmm. You know, but I do believe in a higher power. And next thing I know, I turn around and there's Pastor Rock. Hi, my name's Pastor Rock. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's great. And, uh, you know, um, what I've always appreciated about you, Eric, he took his time to think about this commitment, this step of faith, of baptism. And uh, it's the most important thing that we do in our life to give our lives to Jesus Christ. And it is worthy of taking some time and thinking through it. And when you make that commitment to Jesus, uh, to make sure you do it with your whole heart. And the Lord assists us, doesn't He? So I'm just really looking forward to this baptism. And uh, we'll do that at the end of the service. But uh, let's stand. And uh, Luke, you can lead us in the call to worship. And we'll start with, with worship this morning. We have call and response this morning. So if you'll please join me. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God.
seated. That song always gets me a little bit. It always convicts me somewhere in there. Usually it's either uh, whom you love, I love, or how you serve, I'll serve. That always catches my attention. It reminds me that um, I don't get the luxury when I'm following Christ of deciding who I don't want to love. Yeah, that's, that's not one of the things I can do. God loves all of us. And so he asks all of us to love each other. All right, as we prepare for our offering, I invite our ushers to come forward. And let's pray over our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you give good gifts to us. We thank you that your scripture says that you'll provide for everything we need. And we don't need to worry, but only to trust you. We also know that uh, the amount that you give us, whatever it is, in time or in money, uh, we have to use wisely. So we pray for wisdom as individuals, as families, and as a church to use these gifts well. In Jesus' name, amen. or what wonderful things happen this week in our lives. That no matter where we come from as we walk in here today, you're here for all of us. You're here in of all of us. We'll open ourselves to you. We pray that you will help us each to open ourselves this morning and to hear the word that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The kids can come on up on the stage here for a children's message with Pastor Brock. And after the children's message, you can go to Children's Church or go back to sit with your families.
Hey, I got a riddle for you, okay? How come pigs are bad at basketball? How come pigs are bad at basketball? <gasps> Do you guys know? Yes? Because they can't shoot. Because they can't shoot? Yes? No hands. No hands? Those are all good reasons. Is that the reasons? No. Because they hog the ball. <laughs> I'm not sure where you're getting all these jokes, but they're kind of corny. Like corny, like pigs eat, huh? That's a bad joke. I'm kind of noticing that you have a new look today. Yeah. Did you decide that you wanted to get some hair and you got a wig or something because, because you were kind of growing bald a little bit there? No. Well, why do you have this, all this white hair there? Well, it's because I'm celebrating my superhero. Your superhero. And who would that be? Let's see. Can you guys think of any superhero that has white hair? Yes. Okay. Not sure. Any superheroes that white have? I think, what about Storm on X-Men? She's got, like, white hair, doesn't she? I am not Storm on X-Men. <laughs> no. My superhero is Super Grandma. Super Grandma? I've never heard of a superhero called Super Grandma. Sure you do. Your mom, my grandma, is a superhero. Well, first of all, let me let you know that my grandma... She might have had white hair, but she never had white hair because my grandma always dyed her hair brown, so she didn't have white hair. Oh, if I'd have known that, I'd brought my brown wig. Okay, now why are you celebrating Super Grandma as your superhero? Because she was a hero of the faith. She brought you to Sunday school in church, and she had devotions with the family. And she taught you about God, and because of that, I learned about God. Well, I guess you're right. That's kind of like being a superhero in the faith of, of the Spirit. Kids, can you think of anybody that you know? It doesn't have to be a grandma, or it could be a grandpa, it could be mom or dad. Can you think of somebody who teaches you about God that's a superhero of the faith? Who? Okay, all right. Anyone else? Who's, who's a superhero of the faith? Yes. Okay, maybe me. Thank you very much. That's the answer I was looking for. Actually, I didn't, I wasn't thinking of that. How about somebody in your family? Yes, Journey. He's a boy. He's a boy, yeah. He's not a grandma, is he? Yeah. Any other superheroes? Think of somebody that teaches you about God. What about your children's church or Sunday school teachers? Oh, no. Right? Okay, yes, uh huh. Teacher at the church. Yes, uh huh, uh huh. And maybe some of you do have grandmas and grandpas that teach you about God too, right? Or even parents, right? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Ethan? Um. My grandma teaches me about God. Your grandma, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. That's a puppet. It is? <laughs> yes, it is. I'm a, I might look like a puppet, but inside, I'm a kid. Oh, no. And I'm a superhero of the faith because I teach you kids about God every Sunday. So, you be superheroes. You teach other people about God, okay? Thank you for listening, kids, and you have a good day. Yeah, right. Can't pull it over on them. They know that's a puppet. It's not real. <laughs> Thank you.
Think for a moment, who is your hero of the faith? Think for a moment. Uh-huh. Anybody, you don't have to uh, tell why they're their superhero, but maybe mention their name. Anybody want to mention a name of some? Yes, Barbie. Linda Carter is Wonder Woman. She oh, Linda Carter, Wonder Woman? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about heroes of the faith. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. But people who maybe taught you about God. Anybody? Yes. My grandmother. Your grandmother? My godmother. Your godmother? Well, oh, that's a good name for a hero of the faith. Godmother, yeah. So, yeah. Well, you probably can all think of someone. In my family, it was Reverend Stanley who led my parents to the Lord and helped mature them in Christ. And uh, for me, it was a, a Sunday school teachers that I grew up with and that taught me things. And my mom, of course. Well, in, in Hebrews today, we're going to hear about all the Old Testament li listing of all the heroes of the faith. And you can kind of tell that this was written to Jewish people because he just briefly mentions these people and they're supposed to all know who these people are. And so if you read your Bible or you're raised in the church where you learned your Bible, you probably know all these people. But if you're fairly new to the church or to your faith, you may not know about these people. And so I've written in the bulletin the passages of Scripture where they come from. And you can read, if you want to, on your own time, we won't do it today, all these fascinating stories of these heroes of the faith that are being referred to in this 11th chapter of Hebrews. But I'm going to go through this verse by verse and just very briefly make a few comments this morning. Last week I preached on the first three verses, basically, of chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So remember last week I talked about how faith is not blind faith. It's not faith in something that's not true and has no evidence. Faith is a relationship of trust and love and obedience. Looking up and seeing God in nature, looking around and seeing God at work in people's lives, and looking in and seeing God's work in our lives, and that we are to live in faith is to live aware of God around us, or with an openness to look around us and see where God might be working. Now verse 4, By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did, by faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Uh, in the Bible, uh, Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, came and brought offerings to God. And uh, Abel's offering was accepted by God and Cain's was not. And then Cain got jealous and he murdered his brother. And you may say, well, why was Abel's sacrifice accepted and Cain's not? And the writer of Hebrews says it's by faith that the offering was made. And if you look in the Old Testament, you see some, re some things that God says about offerings when we offer something to God. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And we read for the call to worship, Michael 6, verses 6 through 8. I'll just touch on verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And Hosea, it says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So Cain's actions showed that his heart was not right. He got jealous of Abel and he killed him. You see, God looks at the heart. He looks at motives. He doesn't just look at the amount of offering that we give to God. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And you'll find the story of Enoch in, in Genesis chapter 5. It just says that he was walking with God and God took him. And the Hebrews believe that, that he didn't die, that he was taken to heaven. And there's kind of a little bit of a story on that. And that is, uh, some folks say that Enoch and God were walking and God said, we're closer to my place than yours. How about you just stay with me? 
Enoch showed that it is possible to walk with God like Adam and Eve walked with God before sin came in and before the fall of God. Before the fall of man. Thank you, Gene. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Interesting there, it talks about it was holy fear. Um, uh, Noah feared the Lord and what he would do to the earth more than he feared the jeers of the people who made fun of him when he was building an ark for a hundred years. He respected God more than man. So that was part of his faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham was the worshiper of one God in the midst of a polytheistic, a many-God-worshipping culture in Haran. And uh, he was called to go to the promised land. And he left that land and he followed what he believed God wanted him to do. He moved from the wicked place and he longed for that promised land. Sometimes faith calls on us to something better. We're called to a better life, a better place. Faith is the call of God and our response to the call of God in our lives. And by faith, even Sarah, who was Abraham's wife, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. If you remember the story, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 70 when God promised that he would give him a son that would be uh, an heir to a people who would be numerous as the stars in the sky or the sa sand on the sea. And that through this sun, all the earth would be blessed. And of course, we know that it is in the, through the Jewish line of Abraham that Jesus came. So, but it's interesting here. He says it was Sarah's faith. But if you read the story, Sarah laughs when she hears that God's going to uh, have uh, a son through her. And uh, so it really wasn't Sarah's faith, faith that uh, brought Isaac about, their son, but Abraham's faith. You know, sometimes we need the faith of another for us and for our children. Now it says in verse 13, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. And when I was reading that, I was thinking, not so much in the, in the fact that we have to, like Abraham, actually leave Modesto and go someplace else, although sometimes people calls... Uh, God calls people to leave the location they're at to do His will somewhere else. But there's a sense in which every one of us is looking for a better country. That's why we're here today. We believe that by connecting with God and connecting with one another that we will be encouraged to become more than what we are right now. And there is a temptation to, to go back because sometimes the road that we have to take to get to the better place with the Lord is a very difficult road. And sometimes we're tempted to go back, like the people of Israel were continually being tempted to go back to Egypt. But he's holding these people up and saying, that desire you have in your heart for something better, that comes from God, and the response is to obey God even though you don't see it all right now happening in your life. We desire a better country. That's faith. 
Psalm 48 speaks about the city of God where we will meditate upon God's faithfulness and love. We all know that someday we will definitely be in that better country. It's called heaven. Revelation 21 talks about it. The Apostle John had this vision of heaven. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And throughout Scripture, there's the promise of eternal life, that we can become children of God. And that eternal life begins here and now when by faith we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. But it continues on and it will culminate with us being in heaven with God someday. Faith. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now the story of Abraham, his whole life, is a story of someone who obeyed God when it didn't seem reasonable. I mean, he was a wealthy man back in Samaria. He had dozens of servants and thousands of sheep and, and dozens of donkeys. Why would you just pick up and move after establishing your home and, uh, there and move all the way to the promised land? To endanger yourself on the highway in a, in a horrible place where there were bandits? And then later on, he had left and he had followed the one God. And God said, you, you should not sacrifice your sons like the pagans did. They killed their sons and sacrificed them on altars and killed them. Some of them even made them pass through fire and burned them up as sacrifices to the gods. He had left those pagan cultures, and then here he hears God saying to him, sacrifice your son. That did not make any sense at all. In fact, really the only sense you can make of that is that God was testing his faith or that God wanted us to send a foreshadow, a little story that said, I did not require Abraham to sacrifice his own son, but I was willing to sacrifice my son. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. One of the really cool things about Hebrew culture is that when a person got really old and they thought they wouldn't live a whole lot longer, they would bring their, their, their uh, sons in and they would bless them and, and it was like a last will and testament. They would tell them who gets the property and so forth. But it was more than just a financial thing. It was a spiritual blessing. They would impart wisdom to them and they would say what they, by faith, what they saw that those sons could become, those children could become in God. The blessing. That was all by faith. But we see how those blessings came true. When uh, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, he saw the kingdoms of Israel and Edom, and that came true. And uh, e Edom and Israel were always fighting with one another. And Jacob, when he was blessing each of his sons, he saw uh, what would happen, and his blessing came true, all by faith. You know, there comes a time when we must give our children up to God in prayer and faith. I think the sooner we do that, the better. We can raise them, we can teach them, but we have to give our kids to God in faith. And a blessing is one of the most wonderful things that we can impart to our family. Not only the life that we live, but also what we see in them. They may not ob always obey God right now, but if they stay connected to God, we have to have faith that He will bring them to the promised land. Verse 22, By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Wow, that was a lot of faith. And in the bulletin you can read both places where he gives instruction. Then later on when the Israelites left Egypt, they, they remembered the promise 
made to Joseph. And they brought his bones with them and buried him in the promised land. Now, if you read scripture, you find out that that was 400 years. So 400 years before the Israelites entered the promised land, uh, Joseph is saying, I know you're going to enter the promised land, even though right now we're in Egypt. I know you're going to be there, and when you go there, bring my bones with you, because I want my final resting place to be the promised land. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, it doesn't say this in the Old Testament, but when the king of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, commanded that all the Israelites give up their firstborn sons, uh, or give up their sons, uh, the only way that you could even expect someone to give up their child to be killed would be if you threatened the whole family with death. So that's kind of what he's. I believe he's referring to here. He's saying. They would rather all themselves die than give Moses up to this horrible king to be killed by Pharaoh. You can read the story. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now, Moses was raised in an Egyptian pagan family where they believed in this pantheon of gods. In fact, the Egyptians even said that Pharaoh was God. And as a prince of God or a Pharaoh, he could enjoy all the, the wealth and the pleasures of Egypt, but Moses did not identify with his adopted family. He identified with the Hebrew children and chose to suffer with them. And I was thinking about that, and you know, there are people who identify with God or go to church or, or become Christians and they are not in a Christian family and they have to suffer as part of that family because they realize that there is a deeper bond of, of family which is called the family of God. We are children of God and we are all created by God and He's our Heavenly Father. And so it's by faith that that uh, people take that step. Moses was an example there for us. Now it's interesting, when I was reading through this, there was something that kind of sparked my interest, and that was verse 26. It says, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. I would expect that it would not use the word Christ there, but use the word God, because this is the Old Testament. It, it seems like it should have said he regarded disgrace for the sake of God as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because the whole Old Testament story of Moses does not mention Jesus. It only mentions God. So what's going on here? Well, you can think about that a little while. My conclusion is that Christ and God are same in the one. This is another example of many examples in Hebrews where Christ and God are used, the terminology is used synonymously. And when you read the story of Moses, the freedom from slavery, Moses as a savior coming from the wilderness and coming and rescuing the people. When you read the story about the lamb whose blood was shed and the angel of death passed over and the firstborn of Egypt died, you see, all these things in literary devices we would call foreshadow of things to come. And the story of Moses and the deliverance of the people of Israel is a story that's kind of tipping us off that there's another deliverance that's going to come. Jesus is going to be the Lamb of God. And He is the firstborn Son who's going to give Himself for us to free us from the slavery slavery of sin and free us to go to the promised land, to cross through the waters into the next life, into the promised land. There's all of this alliteration there. And so the story of Moses is not just a story about the people of Israel and God. It is a story of salvation of the people of Israel. It's an incredible story. And as a Christian, you look back and you see that. 
And that's why he said he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ, salvation, as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward, the promised land. Verse 27, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And Jesus, when he celebrated the Passover feast before his resurrection, said, As often as you do this, remember me. I'm the Passover lamb. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Imagine the faith of trusting in God and the, the, the water parts, and you're walking through the Red Sea. The faith that you had. I hope that this thing doesn't come crashing down on us. We were uh, My son and I, were, Brian, were watching uh, surfing videos yesterday and some of the largest surfs in the world. And I don't know much about surfing. I haven't really done any surfing. Brian's done a little bit of it. And Brian was saying, that wall of water there is so big, it's coming at you like 80 miles an hour. And he said, it's like hitting the, wall, the, 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 the water at 80 miles an hour. He said, that wall of water could itself kill you. It's really dangerous to surf in, in 30 foot waves. So imagine, you know, those walls of water, and they'd never done surfing before, you know. They were surfing on dry land. I prefer the dry land surfing, don't you? Faith. By faith they passed through the Red Sea. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. That's an incredible story. You can read that. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now here she was a Gentile, a non-Jew, and a prostitute, yet faith was enough to save her. Doesn't matter what you've done. And the point that he's making throughout here especially among those Jewish or Hebrew Christians who looked to getting into the promised land or heaven if they believed in heaven, was that I have to be perfect in order to get into that place. And what he's saying here, all through the Old Testament, it wasn't how perfect you are. It was a relationship of faith with God that brings you into the promised land. And some did not even see the promised land. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. Remember the story of Daniel? Quenched the fury of the flames. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They would have. And escaped the edge of the sword. Elijah? whose weakness was turned to strength, Samson, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, David and all the others. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, the widow uh, uh, that Elijah and Elisha, both of them raised up children. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. Jeremiah and all the prophets, they were put to death by stoning. Zechariah, maybe Jeremiah, and even Stephen. They were sawed in two. Tradition has it that Isaiah was sawed in two. They were killed by the sword, Uriah and the other prophets. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, Elijah, John the Baptist. They were destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. The, all of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament is faith, and it's all looking forward to Jesus, the coming of Jesus. That's what Hebrews is about. Often God requires us to act faithfully even unto death, even when our faith is not seen in this life. You see, his plan involves all of human history. And he will sometimes allow us to suffer for the bigger and the longer picture. Why should we be surprised? Jesus suffered for us and he did not withhold his very own son. 
And then he concludes this in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the heroes of the faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It is clear that he's writing to people that are undergoing persecution that may undergo even more severe persecution. And he's saying, look at the heroes of the faith, how they stood up. And look at Jesus himself. And let it inspire your courage and your faith to stay strong, even though things are really do going bad for you. When we're going through tough times, we need to look back and see what God has done in our lives and in the lives of those who have gone on before us. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles. I think everybody has a weakness. For some, it's depression. For some, it's anger. For some, it's lust. For some, it's, it's uh, discouragement. For some, it's physical infirmity that just won't go away. For some, it's an addiction. Everybody's got some kind of weakness that can entangle you. And we have to humbly come before our God and we have to give it up to Him daily and allow Him to work in our lives. Throw off that sin that so easily tangles. Let the fire of persecution or, or the tough times, rather than driving you away from God, back to the old life, back to the life of slavery in Egypt, let it drive you forward and seek the promised land that lies ahead. And then he says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, it, I know it doesn't look like it right now, but I used to be a runner, okay? Okay. <laughs> back for asthma and a bad knee. And, and I was a distance runner. And the thing about distance running is this. It isn't, it isn't the pain itself that's the hardest part about distance running. When you're running, and like when I was in college and I was in a five-mile race, right at around three or four miles, it was really hard. The thing that really bugs you is there's this little voice that says, if you just let up a little bit, it won't hurt so much. And then there's this other little voice that says, you can't do that. If you let up a little bit, you're not going to finish where you need to be. That psychological stress is the hardest part of it, especially competitive running. Let us run with perseverance the race dark marked out for us. You look ahead and you focus on the finish line. You think about how you're going to feel when you place where you want to place. And you, and you do a good job and you focus on that rather than, oh, the pain of what you're going through. You know, spiritually that can happen too. If you just slip back a little bit, if you just kind of like... Don't stick up for your faith or deny, if you deny your faith a little bit, if you're not quite, you know, quite there, you qu don't quite do what, what you really feel in your heart you need to be doing, if you just kind of let it slip a little bit, then the pressure from the outside is going to be a lot less. Just slip up a little bit. Just let it go, you know. Instead, be like the prophets. No matter how hard it was, they kept their eyes focused on God. What is the race that God has marked out for you? What is the race that God has marked out for you? I think everybody has a different race. Everybody's a different situation. Does it include hard times and rough roads? I hated hills when I was running. You know, the race includes some hills. Keep in the race. Keep your eyes not on the hills, but on the finish line. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He started our faith, and He will perfect it. Perfect means bring to the end. That's what we really mean here. He's going to bring us to the finish line. When Stephen was stoned, the first Christ Christian martyr other than Jesus, he was looking toward heaven... And he saw heavens open and the Son of Man, Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God. 
And when we go through hard times, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He's the pioneer, the one who began your faith. He blazed the trail. You don't have to blaze the trail. You simply follow him, like that song we sang. Where you go, I'll go. Whom you love, I love. Whom you want me to serve, I will serve. I will follow you. That's what it is to be a disciple, to follow the pioneer of our faith and to follow him to the end. The end is with him. So what is the better country for you? Keep the faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will see that better country. We're going to sing a song as we close this service and Eric and I are going to go get changed. And by faith we believe that this start of this journey signified by baptism that God is going to help Eric to, to uh, finish the race. And so you all stand and you can sing as the worship te team leads you in singing.
baptismal lights are down below. The, the one on the right, very, very right, the, the pod there. Yeah, that's it. Well, Eric has a couple people he wants to thank first uh, before we get into the baptism, so I'll, I'll give, it, give it over to him. Okay, well, um, man, you won't believe what I had to go through just to be here today. <laughs> Anyways, uh, of course, I'm sorry, I'll thank my mom. She, she's not here today, but, uh, you know, through God's gift of life and through her, you know, I, I'm here, so um, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Brock, of course, um, throughout the years, time, and knowledge, and wisdom kind of helped me through, and of course, uh, a big great thanks to Joe, uh, Joe and Michelle Williams um, through their ministry. They're the ones that uh, kind of started me opening that book, and uh, kind of brought me here where I am now, so thank you. Eric, to be baptized is to say before all people that you're starting a new life and that um, you're, you're a disciple of Jesus. You already answered the questions, so we're going to go ahead and baptize you now. Eric O'Brien, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ and raised to new life. Everybody may stand and I'll dismiss you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's, it's through faith that we open up to you. But it's you who does the work. And so, Lord, we're thanking you for the work that you're doing in Eric and in his family's life. As that song we just uh, sang, that's our prayer. We believe that you who started this work will bring it to completion. That you'll finish it that you'll be with Eric through all of his days, helping him to become more and more the person that you created him to be. And to you be the glory, the honor, ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, go with you. God bless. <laughs>